Okay, so in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for Thursday, December 16th, 2021. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through a Microsoft Teams live event. Links can be found on the BCPS website and on board docs. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Pastor. Present. Mr. Offerman. Present. Dr. Hager. Present. Ms. Mack. Present. And Ms. Thomas. Mr. Thomas, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Present. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Holmes? Dr. Wistead? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Perrin-Josie? Present. Dr. Elmendorf? Present. Ms. Cox, please call and note the names of all staff members participating in the meeting. Request if there are any other, oops, any other members participating on the call that you have not named. I have Ms. Schubert. Present. Mr. Stahl. Present. Mr. Billingsley. We might be in later. Um, Mr. Crispins and Dr. Biancoli. They might all be in later for the, their presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Cox. You're welcome. And I'm going to try to pull up. All right, I'm just going to call on <laughs> Dr. Can... Dr. McComas. Yes, ma'am. So we're I happy uh, to take no, it away. I, I can do the welcome. Wait a minute without seeing, pulling up this agenda. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. And I'm just at the beginning, just going to um, wish all of you a safe and wonderful holiday season. Um, since we won't reconvene until after the holiday. And with that, now I'll turn it over to you, Dr. McComas. Yes, ma'am. So um, welcome everyone. Um, we're, we're pleased today. We have uh, several topics that we'll be presenting on. We have no items for approval today. So these are all informational um, topics for um, your benefit and, and to support um, your work as board members. Our first topic for today is really an update on our magnet assistance um, program grant. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Elmendorf, Ms. Schubert, and Mr. Stoll, and they'll provide you an update of exactly where we are related to that grant and what you should anticipate um, moving forward. 
Thank you very much, Dr. McComas. Next slide, please. Okay, the, the purpose of the Magnet Schools Assistance Program or MSAP grant is directly aligned with board policy 0100, specifically the portion indicating that it is a priority to quote, recruit and increase participation of persons from underrepresented groups in school programs, unquote. We are appreciative of the board's support of MSAP grant in the past. As you'll hear today from the Magnet team, the grant is sunsetting in September 22, and we will be seeking the board's support with budget requests as a result. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Schubert and Mr. Stoll, who will walk us through how we have used the MSAP grant to enhance the degree to which we are providing equitable access to our Magnet programs. Ms. Schubert, next slide. Thank you, Dr. Almendorf, and thank you to the committee. We're very excited to share with you the incredible work that has happened in our schools um, under the auspices of these federal funds. So in our teaching and learning framework, the core belief that aligns to this presentation is that we believe instruction must be accessible for all students. Accessible instruction promotes equity for students and their learning, irrespective of students' backgrounds and abilities, and disrupts disproportionate outcomes. Next slide, please. So the Magnet School Assistance Program grant provided an opportunity to develop a K-12 International Baccalaureate Pathway on the west side with a primary years program at Woodmore Elementary, a middle years program at Windsor Mill Middle, and the middle years program, diploma program, and career related program at Newtown High School. We also added a middle years program on the east side at Middle River Middle School that provided a pathway into the existing IB program at Kenwood High School. Additionally, a grade 6 to 12 health science pathway was created at Golden Ring Middle and Overly High School, providing east side students with access to health science programming that mirrors what's available to students on the west side. Next, next slide, please. Thought we'd begin this afternoon with just some background about the inception of the grant and um, really the intent of the grant. So in fall of 2017, BCBS was awarded a five-year, $15 million federal grant, $15 million federal grant to develop five new magnet schools and significantly revise one existing magnet school. The grant officially began on October 1st, 2017, and as Dr. Elmendorf alluded to, it will end or sunset on September 30th, 2022. We're in the final and fifth year of the grant funding. The grant includes nine performance measures focused on the following overarching project objectives, decreasing minority group isolation, improving student achievement and college and career readiness, providing equitable student themed based skill development and enhancing instruction through teacher professional development. Another objective of the, of the grant is to shift perceptions of the school within the community. In co collaboration with BCPS Department of Research and Accountability and Strategic Planning, the schools were selected to participate in the grant based on their geographical location. So we were looking to expand magnet um, offerings, but also balance which magnet programs were available in the county. We looked at um, schools that had um, diversity challenges, and we also looked at schools that had the capacity to accept additional students, really based on the capacity of the building and how many students were enrolled at the time, as well as stakeholder support, both um, with the staff at the school and uh, community interest. At Overly High School, the new health science program replaced a low interest magnet program and provided an opportunity to leverage the rapidly expanding career field in the greater Baltimore area. There are several contracted vendors who assist with meeting the grant's performance measures, including an external evaluator that's tasked with providing ongoing feedback to drive program improvement. The external evaluator is also engaged in a required evidence of promise study that is a requirement of the federal government and that will evaluate the efficacy of the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program in alignment with the What Works Clearinghouse standards. Next slide, please. So the central office has been staffed with a grant funded supervisor, specialist and fiscal assistant who provide critical guidance and support to the MSAP funded schools. And every MSAP school has been staffed with two grant funded positions a 12 month non teaching resource teacher to coordinate the overall program development and implementation. And a 10 month resource teacher to support theme integration across the content areas. 
As was mentioned previously, these grant funded positions will end on September 30, 2022. Next slide, please. Leanne, I think you're, you're muted. You're on mute, Leanne. I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is one of my favorite slides to speak to in the last four years. There have been numerous accomplishments um, at the six grant schools um, carried out by our incredible school-based folks. All four of our international baccalaureate schools successfully completed the incredibly rigorous candidacy process and achieved international baccalaureate world school status. So that means they are authorized as a part of the internationally recognized IB schools, which include 5,000 schools across 158 countries. Our schools continue to meet or exceed most of the federal performance measure targets. In the most recent report, uh, our year four report that was submitted in October of this year, Golden Ring Middle and Overly High School had 23 to 25% increase in applicants as compared to the prior year. 100% of our students at all of the schools participated in four new theme-based interdisciplinary units during last school year. Students at Min uh, Middle River, Windsor Mill, Overly High School, and Newtown increased their theme-based skills. 100% of teachers at Middle River and Windsor Mill engaged in 50 or more hours of new professional development last school year. And 100% of teachers at Woodmore Elementary, Golden Ring, Overly High School, and Newtown implemented theme-related instructional strategies. I just have to point out what an incredibly challenging school year, school year 2021 was, and we are so grateful and thankful for the school-based folks. Those are um, not minor accomplishments and achievements. Recruitment campaigns at the Target Feeder School and surrounding communities are the foundation of efforts to increase diversity at the schools. Our schools were incredibly creative and effective in implementing mostly virtual campaigns in the last two years. Our schools hosted virtual showcase events and Middle River and Windsor Mill also hosted virtual high school magnet fairs to expose their eighth grade students to all of the BCVS magnet program possibilities. Our schools have made tremendous progress engaging families in the community. Some highlights include community health fairs at Overly High School and Golden Ring, which are in partnership with Towson University, a monthly food drive at Woodmore Elementary, and a really exciting partnership with Johns Hopkins University Bayview that not only engages students in the classroom with teachers, but also um, stakeholders and families through an evening speaker series that is hosted monthly. The MSAP team works collaboratively with Sylvan to develop STEM camps at the elementary and middle schools. Education partners provided PD to individual schools, focusing on building the capacity around deeper learning competencies and coaching for transformation. The MSAP central office staff continues to build collaborative relationships with CNI and academics to support schools. And very exciting, Windsor Mill Middle School, just a shout out, was proudly recognized as a new and emerging Magnet School of Merit by Magnet Schools of America. So although increasing student achievement continues to be a goal of the grant, and quite frankly, BCPS, achievement data has not been available for the last two years due to the impacts of the pandemic on testing and were not reported to the federal government. Next slide, please. So one of the primary goals of the grant is to provide seed money to establish impactful and sustainable magnet programs. And thanks to the extraordinary combined efforts of central office, and school-based staff and leadership, exemplary high interest magnet programs supported by the surrounding communities have been successfully established. We extend an enormous amount of gratitude and appreciation to the work accomplished by the administrators and teachers in all six of the schools. As a grant sunsets in less than a year, funding has been requested in the FY23 budget to support staffing and ongoing program implementation costs, including professional development, program related fees and marketing and recruitment efforts. This request includes six and a half school based teacher positions to provide the same level of support available in other magnet schools. Uh, each school would receive one FTE and Newtown High School will receive an additional half of an FTE to support their three IB programs. Two central office FTEs were also requested to support the growing number of magnet programs in BCPS, 
and to provide crucial ongoing support for the now seven schools with IB programs in the county. A per pupil magnet funding request was made that is in alignment with the funding provided to the other BCPS magnet programs. And I just want to go back to uh, the FTEs for the schools that we're requesting for the schools. Providing each school with an additional FTE is, a, is critical to the ongoing sustainability and success of the magnet programs. Some of the responsibilities of this position include promoting and recruiting for the program to ensure parents and students are aware of the opportunities and the benefits of the programs, providing students with opportunities beyond the curriculum, including coordinating field trip experiences, speaker events, a variety of theme related activities and after school and summer programs. They also monitor student performance and provide supports to the students if needed to help the students meet with success in the programs. They help facilitate professional development, ensuring magnet teachers are informed of current standards and best practices. And they do a great deal of communicating with families, keeping families informed of student progress and program related events and activities. And many of our coordinators, our school based teachers uh, for the magnet programs also teach classes. Some of them will teach a specialized course. And in other cases, they'll teach a content area that allows for smaller class sizes in our specialized magnet classes. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up and mention is that the US Department of Education has contacted us and offered a one year no cost extension to continue program development and implementation if there's any unspent grant funds at the end of this, this school year. Um, an extension would continue implementation of MSAP initiatives, including professional development, family and community engagement, and program evaluation. And if we need to request a no cost extension, we'll certainly provide an update at that time. Next slide, please. So in the final and uh, fifth year of the project, we focus on program sustainability beyond the grant, um, ensuring that the foundation that has been made um, within the project continues to be successful. The grant will continue to be monitored by the federal government for the next three years after it ends, and all records and documentation will be maintained. Efforts will continue to focus on performance measures, absolutely supporting our schools as we do with all of our magnet schools, um, and as they work to meet those performance goals. And central office staff will continue to provide support as programs continue to grow and provide incredible opportunities for our students. So at this point, we ask if there are any questions. OK. Um, yes, did you want to, was that Dr. McComas? I just naturally wanted to start calling on people who are raising their hands. I'm sorry, Miss Bester, it was the teacher and me. I, I know, me. calm down. The teacher and me was getting ready to talk at the same time. <laughs> no, the principal and me, just like that was the principal and you. All right. I. Um, see that Mr. Offerman has a question and Mr. Offerman will be followed by Mr. Thomas. Mr. Offerman. Thank you. Uh, very exciting to hear these things. Uh, I have a question. Has the teacher shortage situation that the whole country is dealing with, uh, but but also here, of course, is this impacting finding finding uh, finding uh, the right the right staff to fill these positions and the staffing in general for the IB program or for uh, specific magnet programs who have people with needs for specific skills. Sure, so first thanks um, Mr. Offerman um, for helping us clarify that. So we currently, the you know, the grant funding is really seed money to help us launch these programs. So through the grant, we have already been able to fund at each school uh, two school-based positions um, to help launch the programs. With the grant going away, what we're asking for is the funding to sustain one position so that it would be the same as all of our other magnet programs so that they wouldn't have less. 
um, but neither would they any, any longer have more because the grant is gone. So I share that with you as context to understand we actually already have people in these roles um, and as a result we're just we would really be moving forward. So we already have people with those particular skills in place in terms of um, any subject area instruction related to IB or otherwise, like if you're a teacher in one of the IB schools, then there's um, training, specialized training related to IB that um, is provided to those faculty members. And so, you know, those schools are struggling with overall staffing, as you mentioned. Um, and so in that regard, the staffing affects these schools in the same way it affects all the other schools, but the particular uh, magnet coordination position, we already have people in that uh, in those roles with that skill set. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Offerman, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Fashore. Um, I want to start off by saying that I think it's, IV is so incredible, and I love that we're now seeing a a pathway for IB in the West Zone. Um, if I could go back in time to eighth grade and apply to the Kevin High School IB program, I would just because I know how amazing IB is. Uh, one of the kind of things that I've realized as I'm as I'm approaching my school visits, um, I went to Overly High School, and they talked about the health services uh, magnet that they have now, but. I heard someone mention that there was a program that was removed from Overly High School to create that. And I believe that was the JROTC program at Overly High School. Oh, OK, please correct I, me. Actually, uh, I'm sorry. I should let you finish, Mr. Thomas. I, there is a point of clarification there, so. OK, well, so I was talking to students, and I, I guess one of the concerns I had, my mom was a member of the JROTC program at Overly High School when, when that was listed, and that completely changed her pathway in life. And so. I just wanted to know if the overly high school or if the JRTC program was removed because of the entries magnet program and maybe are there pathways to include more students in the health sciences program since JRTC was more open for students to participate in. Yeah, first off, uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify because clearly there's some misconception in the community and I would appreciate you being an ambassador to help me sure. clarify that misunderstanding. We did not stand down the ROTC program at Overly to stand up the magnet program through this magnet assistance. That may have happened during the same time period, but the JROTC program was um, sadly stood down um, at that time for reasons completely separate from the magnet uh, grant. Um, what we have in Baltimore County, and I'll just um, give a brief overview right now because our it's not the topic of, of today's discussion. Um, and some of our members, I know Ms. Mack, Ms. Pasture, and I think Mr. Offerman were with us um, when we had to go through some of the difficult um, choices related to our ROTC programs. Our ROTC programs are programs that are issued by the federal government. There is a limited number of programs that the federal government issues for the entire nation. And there are criteria to maintain those programs, some of which deal with the um, the level of officer and enlisted personnel that you need to run those programs with the fidelity that the Army and Air Force and Navy and Marine Corps require. We had an unusual uh, large number of Marine Corps um, ROTC programs and the challenge is we do not have in this Maryland, Delaware, um, Southern PA area Marine Corps bases, and it's really difficult to get retired officers and enlisted to live in this area because um, the cost of living for retirees in the military, you, you find that in other geographic regions of the nation. Long story short, they were some of the background reasons why we had to stand down some programs and we, it was not just uh, recently at um, Overly. We also unfortunately had to stand down programs in other locations and we have other ROTC programs where we've had to in the Navy uh, go to a different level uh, while we're rebuilding some programs. So please know that all of that was entirely completely separate from this magnet uh, program um, grant. Um, even if that happened to coincide in the same time period, they were completely uh, unrelated in terms of 
the what, why, and how of those matters. So I, and we can get into that yes. uh, another time, but thank you for the opportunity because I, it breaks my heart to think that, um, especially as an Army veteran myself, as, a, as someone who went through ROTC in college, um, I'm very committed to our military service programs. Um, and in fact, I'm very proud that our retired Colonel Bennett um, has worked with MSDE to actually get our ROTC programs approved as official CTE pathways. So um, it's not for lack of commitment on our part. There were just confounding variables beyond our direct control, to be honest. Okay, so and thank we'll you. Get so back to Magnet. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for clarifying that, um, uh, Dr. McComas, and uh, thank you for sharing everything that that went into that uh, decision. I just wanted to mention that the dental program at Overly High School is so innovative and so incredible. Uh, and and uh, I, I just had a question as to um, how the different health services with this grant differ from maybe the allied health courses at uh, Sellers Point Technical uh, School or Eastern Technical High School. I'll hand that over to the team. They have the expertise to talk at that level of detail. That's a great question. So one of the things um, when we were in the process of the grant application, um, so living in this area, we all know the region is just known and we are so grateful to have um, access to incredible hospital systems in Baltimore. Um, and the job opportunities within that market are something we really thought we could leverage for our students. We also knew in the grant application though, as, as you referenced, um, we have allied health programs that already exist on the east side, right? So Eastern Technical and Sollers um, Point have our allied health, which allows students to potentially graduate with a CPA or a um, CNA, sorry, Certified Nursing Assistant or um, GNA. So we wanted to look at something different, right? So that existed, which is where we looked to the CTE pathways, and that's how we came up with the two um, health-related programs at Overly High School, the dental and the PT, that allow students to, again, pursue kind of a different aspect in um, medical and healthcare. It will also make the plug living in Baltimore if you think about kind of the giant ecosystem that is a hospital, there's so many of our programs that could support, um, you know, the intricacies that are that are a hospital from from human resources to business management to accounting to doctors, nurses and all of that. So there's lots of aspects of a hospital and we were looking to provide a different opportunity for access with the new program at, at Overly. Awesome. Thank you so much and thank you, Ms. Pastor. Sure. Thank you, um, Mr. Thomas, Ms. Shea and Dr. McComas. That was, was that Ms. Shea <laughs> that was speaking? Who was that at the Schubert? Ms. Schubert. Oh, no, Ms. Schubert. Schubert, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schubert. All right, um, Dr. Hager has a question, but I have a question before I call on her. Um, there was a comment that there will be an extension if there was unspent grant money at the end of the run, which is upon us. So will there be any unspent money? We do anticipate some carryover funds and we're in the process of working with our grant accountant to make productions on those carryover funds and then do an analysis of the best way to um, use the funds in um, a bonus six year and then work with our grant manager at the federal government to seek approval. Great, thank you. And when applying for the grant and particularly this with the IB and going through through all of the things, all of the steps, was there ever a question asked as part of the grant um, about how you would sustain, how we will sustain the program after the grant period? And if so, what was the response? So I, I'll jump out first and then certainly the team can clarify if there's anything that needs to be. So whenever we, when school systems apply for these startup grants, um, the understanding is that we will, as a school system, when this grant goes away, we will work to maintain that sustainability. And so that's part of the expectation when you're applying for these startup grants. And so I don't know if the team has any like language that's in the specific grant application. No, I, I'm familiar. I just wanted okay. to know what it is. You know, I always have an answer behind my question. I just wanted to know what we said in order to sustain because we're five years out and a number of steps. Um, and I've watched, particularly with the IB, I've watched it. I watched it at Milford 
die an ugly death and create a lot of consternation in that community because whatever we said we were going to do to sustain it obviously didn't happen, which is why it's no longer there. I don't want to see that happen again. So I would like to know what we're looking at in terms of sustaining those programs. Great. So thank you, Ms. Pasture, and I appreciate the context for understanding um, the question. If you could go back, whoever's controlling the slide, to the slide where it says our budget request. And so, what? Oh, wait a minute, went too far. One more. There we go. So, are we good? So yeah. um, what you'll see everyone on our screen here is the request that I have put into our upcoming FY23 uh, cycle. And so you should anticipate seeing this come forward. Um, you know, I know that the whole budget request, you know, of course, typically occurs in January. I, I am just sharing with all of you that I, in, in my role, have submitted um, this request as part of that um, to sustain uh, the program. And so what you're seeing on there are what would become the school based um, magnet facilitators or coordinators of what we use school based magnet coordinators. And they're the positions that Mr. Offerman had asked about that I explained. We currently have people who are doing that work and, and their current positions are funded through the grant. And what we're asking for is that sustaining funding to be able to provide them the same that all of our other magnet programs have. The uh, two central positions are positions to help us sustain exactly what you're saying, Ms. Pasture, that ability to continue to support the volume that these programs have in terms of applications and that entire uh, process, as well as the expertise related specifically to IB. So of those two central positions, one is the supervisor position and one is the specialist. The specialist is the specialist with the um, expertise for IB and to provide direct uh, dedicate support to the, the quality of those programs and everything that goes into those IB programs going through the um, renewal process. I think there's a different term, but they have to every so many years, they have to get recertified as IB schools. And so um, one of those central positions would be dedicated to helping these schools sustain the quality of those programs, dedicated to helping these schools with the recruitment of those programs. And then you'll see the per pupil magnet funding. So, um, and this is um, the dollar amount you see that schools get per student in these programs. Programs. And so the total request um, to cover this is just shy of a million dollars. It's 900. Let me look at it right now. Um, 972,270 dollars is when you have that per pupil uh, uh, allocation for each of these schools. So that's how we want to sustain them as pasture. And forgive me because I actually truly do not know um, the background of what the experience was at Milford Mill. But this, my putting in the grant request is my asking for us to have the capacity to sustain these programs um, with fidelity as they were stood up through the grant. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, um, Dr. McComas. I just want to make sure that as we're talking about growing programs yes. and you put in budgetary items that we are processing all the other things that we add to the system and that all of those options for students who are not in magnet programs as well as those who are are going to be met because we are forward thinking about what needs to happen and that again is is essentially what happened i don't want to see it unfurled also um diversity from the beginning when carver actually was open um as and, and federal monies was about on a desegregation grant at that time mm -hmm. to diversify populations carver is a great example of how that happened but we certainly see around the county um, in other places where it didn't happen in that regard. So I'm asking just as briefly as you can, with the schools that did not, I heard the, the, the percentage for one of the schools, but 
what are we doing in terms of our thinking and planning um, to in this last year and going forward to make sure we're getting in those schools the diverse populations that initially was part of of getting the programs sure sure so i will have the team talk about um that aspect and i will also share um we will be looking at uh, not specific programs but uh, magnet as a totality in our next committee meeting in the equity committee today and so we'll be able to continue to sort of take a deeper dive even beyond just these particular programs that were started up by this grant but what does that landscape look like in in totality across our school system so i'll just share that as well so um miss schubert i don't know if you have any um particular um things that you can share with Ms. Pasture to her question. Sure, um, I appreciate the question very much. Uh, so one of the targets identified in the grant application was to increase diversity at any of the schools um, being supported through federal grant funds. And we actually work in, in partnership with the Office of Civil Rights and the U.S. Department of Education to look at that on an ongoing basis. So strategies that have been employed throughout these four years of the grant and this final fifth year that will continue as we move forward is really part of that marketing and recruitment campaign, right? So when we look at these magnet programs, we look at really promoting and marketing these programs to a wide variety of audiences, parents, you know, outside that that initial uh, neighborhood with for the school, students who live in that neighborhood are zoned, but looking at kind of a, a wider um, population of students to make sure that they're uh, not only aware that the magnet program is, is available, but the benefits of that magnet program um, and targeting um, you know particular schools to increase the diversity and that's something that can, will continue beyond the grant Ms. Pasteur. Okay thank you Ms. Schubert I appreciate it. Um, Dr. Hager followed by Ms. Mack. Sorry, Shane, turn my camera on. I'm so glad you went before me, Ms. Pestier, because you touched on a lot of the things that I was um, going to ask about as well. And so I like the way you framed it when thinking about how we went into the grant thinking about sustainability. And in my mind, if a program can demonstrate that it is effective, then a school system, school board, school leader, school system leadership would want to invest in it. And so I was kind of honing in, as you might imagine, on slide six where the accomplishments were listed. Um, and there were no numbers mentioned. And I understand that the, the grant won't be over for another you know, nine months and you have an external evaluator. Um, but I know I would like to see kind of more hard numbers on the impact of uh, the initiatives that you that, that were um, discussed today. I mean, they, they sound wonderful um, and something that should be invested in regardless, but I would like to see kind of how this has actually worked in the field I don't know if even uh, annual reports are available or something like that, just to, to kind of give us some of those hard numbers would be great. Sure, I um, thank you. I'll work with our team to develop a summary, an executive summary, if you will, and then I'll see if I can submit it perhaps for a weekly up update. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and then my my kind of bigger picture question is, you know, th these are six, six wonderful programs and six schools um, or six schools with programs. Um, have these initiatives trickled over to any of the other magnet programs or have you seen the other changes co coming from the work on the central office and the professional development opportunities and things like that in other schools? So I'll defer to the team on that because they work so closely with all the um, magnet programs. I, I think what you'll see uh, later today, Dr. Hager and the Equity Committee is, and we don't have it as part of this presentation, but you're gonna see the volume of interest that our community has in magnet programs, uh, regardless of, you know, like these are IB programs and health programs, um, but, you're just going to see when you see the number of applicants that we get every year and the number of programs that they apply to because applicants can apply to more than just one uh, program it is incredible versus the actual number of seats that we offer so i'll just I, i'd like to just give you that context and then again i'll have the team if they have anything else they'd like to share 
So Dr. Hager, I just want to make sure I understand your question. You were asking if we've seen any carryover to non-grant schools with the work that has happened. Okay, um, absolutely. So um, certainly, um, you know, immediately what comes to mind would be our um, Eastside International Baccalaureate Program at Middle River. So some of you are aware prior to the grant we had as Mr. Thomas mentioned, <laughs> um, a great segue. We had the IB program at Kenwood High School, but there was no pathway for students to get there. Um, and one of our goals with putting in the middle years program at um, Middle River was to kind of create that, that pathway. Some students are looking for a middle school, high school direct pathway. Some students, you know, take our left or a right turn and, and that's also okay. So um, not funded through the grant, but we really partnered with Kenwood High School. Prior to the grants, Kenwood had um, the DP, the Diploma Program for International Baccalaureate. Um, through operating funds, we helped support Kenwood High School create a middle years program, which supports their ninth and 10th graders. And that was really in partnership with all of our International Baccalaureate uh, schools, both grant funded and not grant funded. So that was the first piece that came together. Um, you know, I will share that we've, um, listen, $15 million is a lot of money, right? <laughs> um, so we had access to some really incredible professional development opportunities. And some of those PD opportunities have carried over to other schools as we've looked at kind of what are the needs of staff in, um, in a non-grant funded school. And we've had a great, you know, great professional development experiences with the vendor. How, how could we take some in-house um, expertise and then expand it to some of those other schools. Um, and then just coming back to kind of that verticality, um, and I'll use Woodmore Elementary, which is a primary years international baccalaureate program. Our belief and our hope is that many of those students may look at Windsor Mill Middle School as a IB middle years program, but that global perspective that our earliest learners get at um, Woodmore Elementary really opens up their minds and their options to go in so many different directions. It's great <laughs> if they choose to stay with IB, but what we have taught them to do is to think critically and to think globally, um, and that could take them on so many different pathways. And, um, you know, a, a five-year-old as opposed to an 11-year-old, some of our kids want to stay with IB, but some of our students might be interested in a STEM opportunity, or maybe they want to go to Northwest Academy and have a health sciences opportunity. And you know what I love about um, the IB programs is it, is it does teaches our kids how to how to think and how to think bigger than their community and themselves. Thank you. Miss Pastor, if you were speaking, you were muted. Ms. Mack, thank you, Mr. Thomas. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Bestier. Um, I agree with Dr. Hager. I do think we need to see the data, but if I understood you correctly, um, Dr. McComas, when the Chiefs submitted their numbers to Dr. Williams and Mr. Saris, this is included in your numbers, so there's not going to be any separate contract or anything like that that is brought to the board. Correct, correct. That's exactly right. This is part of my um, budget request to uh, Dr. Williams. And um, I just, as always, I want to make sure that our committee has the courtesy of understanding things that they may see coming up in the budget process um, and to have the courtesy of providing you an opportunity to kind of ground back in and have this exactly uh, type of discussion, answer your questions so that um, when that comes before you have full understanding. And am I correct in saying that um, depending on the amount of money that we are given by the county um, over maintenance of effort, if if Dr. Williams has to go back to the departments and say, I know that you asked for X number of dollars, but you're only going to get this number of dollars, you then would make the choice of what get, gets cut. Is that correct, Dr. McComas? Uh, yes, that is correct. And so um, in our worst case scenario, if this does not make its way all the way through the budget journey, which we know is long and has many gates of approval, if this was not to make it through the budget uh, process uh, for FY23, then what I would need to do in order to sustain these programs is I would have to go to our current maintenance of effort um, funding, um, budget magnet funding, and allocate, you know, and fold these into what we currently have 
Um, and then if I if I, you know, to try to take from other areas to, to build that up so that we weren't reducing the amount that other magnet programs get, right? Because the pie is is only so big and um, these have been funded through a grant. So if I'm going to add them to the funding, then I have to slice the pie in smaller pieces or I need to ask for more money to make the pie bigger. So in worst case scenario, we would have to go back to our operating funds, maintenance of effort funds and divide them to an to be able to sustain these programs. OK, thank you for that clarification. Um, I met with Dr. Williams and Mr. Saris on Tuesday and they this was part of the discussion that this grant is sunsetting. And then yesterday in the budget committee, we talked about um, separate from all of this, but it ended up including this. What how how is each school funded? Like what are the sources of funding? And we found out that there are two magnet funds, total magnet funds and total magnet expansion funds. Which which one of those categories does this fall in? Do you know? I believe this would fall in the the expansion funds uh, because this was a sort of a special revenue grant fund uh, to specifically to expand uh, magnet programs. But I will. Okay. I will have to confirm that with Mr. Saris, but that that to me is where this would fall in that. OK, thank you. No further questions. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, Dr. McComas, Ms. Shea is up next. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Um, our next agenda item. I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas, I'm not sure what you're showing us, but um, our next agenda item is um, Ms. Shea with our course approval. So I stand corrected. I know I opened our meeting by saying we have no approval items and uh, quite frankly in my head I was thinking we had no instructional materials we were bringing forward for approval ahead of contracts committee, but we do have one approval item this evening. This is part of our, our annual process every year at this time frame. We bring forward um, course updates that need to um, be reviewed and approved and of course they'll continue on their journey um, so that we can have things in place appropriately for summer curriculum writing and uh, things in place for next school year. So uh, with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Ms. Shea and then Ms. Koss will have to remember to come back because this would be a, a, a voting item. OK, thank you, Dr. McComas. Good afternoon, um, board members. Um, yes, as Dr. McComas said, and some of you may remember, I was just here in the spring talking about all the new courses that were going to be in the student's course registration guide for the upcoming school year. Um, what Dr. McComas described is we actually come twice a year now, um, and so this is the midpoint of the year, and that's really for two reasons. Um, this is a much smaller list of the um, updates, and there are things that happened between the time frame of when we brought forward the um, courses for approval. Um, and as I get into some of the details, you'll understand why that's necessary um, for me to add a small number um, at the midpoint of the year. So we can go to the next slide. So in some instances, um, it's because we've been working closely with our partners at CCBC in an effort to expand our dual enrollment offerings. So we um, sometimes that process happens outside of our timeline. And so we're thrilled to be able to say that uh, some of what we are asking for permission to add um, is increased opportunities for our students that are in in our Pathways to Technology Early College High School or PTEC programs. Um, as you know, we have a PTEC program at Dundalk and we have one at Owings Mills. And so we have been working closely um, with CCBC and with Heather Woldridge in her office. Uh, she is forever looking at different course, way, uh, course pathways to try to increase opportunities. So we're going to be able to um, increase opportunities for students enrolled in those PTEC programs to participate in dual enrollment courses. Um, we we also added an internship course for the Pro Start program. So some of you may recall a few years ago, um, we moved to the, actually it's probably our second year uh, because of COVID, uh, we moved to the Pro Start program, which is a uh, much more robust and rigorous offering that we used to use with like a food and nutrition program that some of our schools had that were not quite the culinary arts program. 
but that offered students an opportunity to um, earn that credential as identified from the National Restaurant Association. And so um, what we're bringing forward that we want to add to our course catalog is an opportunity for students in the ProStart program to do an internship. Um, and that will allow them to earn the, I think it's 450 hours that they need um, to be able to earn that uh, serve safe certification, which is part of the value add for that program and very exciting for students that want to um, continue in that work. We also, um, you'll remember that we came several years ago with a very exciting um, CTE innovation grant, uh, which funded our ability to develop an artificial intelligence program, um, which we're very excited about. This is in the beginning stages. We're still in the planning years. Uh, this was a grant offered, um, a grant opportunity offered by MSDE that we were awarded to develop an innovative program. And so ours is going to be in artificial intelligence. And so part of that work, when we meet with um, teams of teachers and schools in advance of starting that program is to develop the coursework. Next slide, please. And so as I mentioned already, we will be uh, bringing forward new courses for that art artificial intelligence program pathway. Um, and then we also have new courses for the Academy of Health Professionals program. And so we are um, adding a clinical internship as well so that we can extend that opportunity. I see Mr. Thomas is excited about that. Um, so we are too. So um, as always, the CTE programs are always looking to continue to not only ensure access and opportunity of program, but then to really make sure that we're constantly um, revising those programs and growing those programs in alignment with industry standards. So we always want to make sure that we are um, moving that bar to make sure that they're really rigorous and relevant. Next slide, please. So for health and PE, you will also recall in this committee, we brought forward the change in MSDE to Comar regulations, um, increasing the graduation requirement for health from a 0.5 to a 1.0. The way that we are approaching that, again, you'll remember from previous presentations, is that we want students to take um, a half credit in 910 and then a half credit in 1112. And there's a plethora of research from the health education perspective of why the developmental needs are so important and why we want to have that sort of distributed practice. The scheduling challenge that creates for schools is it, you need to have something to pair that half credit with. And so while we have a range of electives that we offer at um, half credit, which we have shared with schools, um, classes such as SAT prep or college and career readiness and even some of our arts, we also know that for some of our students, pairing it with a graduation requirement would be really beneficial. And so we are now going to be offering still the credit requirement for physical education is still a 1.0, but we're now going to have options where students can take it either as a 1.0 or schools may offer it as 2.5 credits so that it would then pair with that health credit in the 9, 10, and 11, 12. Um, the goal is just to provide flexible options. This has also become an increased need um, as we have students who transition to us from other uh, school systems. So for example, students in Baltimore City often come to us having already taken a 0.5 physical education course. And without a 0.5, oftentimes we are scheduling these children into the full 1.0. And so in some cases, students are taking more than what they would have needed for graduation, which can be a challenge because those credit hours are so precious as students are making choices. So we we believe we're not eliminating the 1.0 because in some school communities that's still a really viable pathway, um, but by also offering that same physical education graduation requirement as these paired 0.5s, it will work really nicely to support that increase for health education. We have been working on our science offerings for a number of years in our transition to next gen science standards, and so we need a new course number because we have changed the standards. So that curriculum has been in place now for several years in terms of our um, localized pilot and then a longer term pilot, and now we have a new course number. Um, and then social studies, we're very excited. We have an opportunity to work closely with College Board to pilot an expansion of our AP offerings um, titled AP African American Studies. And so in order for us to be able to participate in this pilot with College Board, we have to have a course number in BCPS's course registration guide. Um, we're still working through the details of where and what schools will be able to pilot as schools are right now working on their course requests and schedules and all of that good stuff. So um, I'm certainly happy to 
come back and I know our social studies team is going to be on in a few moments um, as we get more details about that pilot, but we're really excited about that um, opportunity to partner with College Board. And next slide. Oh, I was just trying to click my arrow, Mr. Corns. It didn't work, so <laughs> thank you. Um, and then last but not least, we have a group of courses that we are putting in our course registration guide to support our students receiving special education who need additional coursework as part of our um, provision of service through age 21. So many of our students, as you know, are entitled to receive that ongoing instruction and support through age 21. And so in order to do that and ensure that they were getting content related to that transition. The Department of Special Education under Dr. Perandozzi's leadership um, has developed a series of courses that students can use to help prepare them for that transition. And so these are things like understanding personal health, um, technology education, career preparation, career placement, and then the very important um, independent functioning. So this is a series of courses that will be offered specifically to support students receiving special education who will continue continue to receive that support through age 21 as opposed to a traditional graduation pathway. So um, I know it seems like a long list, but compared to what I normally bring you, this is a smaller list, um, but this we're very excited. All of these will be in the um, so they were not available for print at the time we printed the course registration guide, but they will be in the course catalog. And so what we do now, some of these courses are open for all schools and some are, um, as I mentioned, specific to the programs. Um, once we have approval, then my team will work to communicate with school counselors and master schedulers and department chairs so that they're aware of these offerings. Um, in many cases, it's already on their radar because it's either the next course in a series as we're developing programs or as I mentioned, uh, we've been in ongoing conversations with schools about those half credit pathways uh, to, to help make that health transition easier. So that's everything I have. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Uh, Dr. Hager, Dr. Hager has two, I quote, quick questions. They will be quick, I promise. Um, one is, uh, First of all, I, all the programs you mentioned, I'm a big fan of, so it's, it's nice to hear uh, different ways that you're expanding them and uh, focusing on them. The Pro Start program is wonderful. For the internship that you mentioned, um, are they allowed to get paid for their internship, given that it's often going to be in the restaurant industry? Just if that's that. a great question. Um, I would have to double check on that one specifically because they are earning hours for the credential and sometimes there are rules about that, so I will double check and get a follow up for you on that. Again, some, I think it's really important. Some are paid and some are not, so I have to find out about this one right. specifically. I would just wouldn't want the kids to be, you know, in a situation yeah, where I they're taking it. advantage of. So yeah, no, that would be good to find out. Um, and then uh, for the next generation, Gen Science Physics, is this in addition to the existing physics offerings, or is it? Um, it's just a new course number because we shifted that curriculum, but it's important that when we shift the curriculum, we have course numbers that offer. We actually made that change to the physics course. It's been in process for a number of years. Um, so we're just really, it's what's considered a name change really, but the way that our course file works, it actually winds up being a new course number. Okay. Thank you, that's it. See there, they're fast. They were quick, I agree. <laughs> Outstanding, thank you. Uh, Ms. Mack, uh, Mr. Offerman, Mr. Thomas, do you have any questions, comments? I'm fine, Ms. Pasteur, thank you. Thank I you. I am also, thank you. I'm fine. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, uh, Ms. Pasteur, I do have a question. Uh, it's about the uh, AP African American History course, and uh, so I have been keeping an update on what some of the new AP courses might be offering in the future years. I know this isn't actually a course that is established yet. Can you expand on the pilot program and how BCPS could maybe shift the way that the curriculum is being created for this course? So it, it's a great question and actually in our next presentation I'm going to have my whole social studies team here in okay. a few moments so they'll be really good at, at giving you even more specific information about where we in the pilot. The one thing that I will offer that is a little bit different as you probably know uh, with AP courses is we're really working in partnership with College Board and so whereas there are some courses we have unilateral control about the curriculum development if you will um, that's different when we're offering an AP course because those syllabi and the um, kind of standards and expectations are 
are really set by College Board, and then we work in partnership with them. Um, so I know that um, Mr. Billingsley and Dr. Biancoli are here, so I want to invite them if they have anything else they want to add to Mr. Thomas's question uh, specifically about the work we've done um, so far. Um, and I know Mr. Crispins is here too, but he's my elementary coordinator, so I don't know if he's going to. Um, there's Dr. Biancoli. Do you have anything you want to add about the AP, African American AP course that we're getting ready to pilot? No, just that we have submitted a list of schools who expressed interest to the College Board, and it's actually the College Board who will pick the schools that are able to pilot for next school year. And it will be one of those instances, like Ms. Shea said, that they are really in the driver's seat of creating that framework for the course. Um, we haven't actually seen the completed framework yet, uh, but we're very excited based on the synopsis that we were given. And then it will be something that hopefully the feedback that our teachers are able to provide will help the, uh, the final formation of the course before it rolls out as a nationwide AP course. So that's our hope. Awesome, thank you so much. And I'm excited that BCFS might be engaging uh, in this work. So are we. Uh, Dr. McComas. Oh, I was just going to say it's an exciting ground level opportunity and, uh, <laughs> and it's wonderful to think that we may be able to have voice in shaping that course, not just for our own students, but for students across the entire nation. So. If I may, I was able to get an answer to Dr. Hager's question because my CTE team is just amazing. They like are always at the ready. Um, so Dr. Grubbs has shared that students can get paid, but they don't have to. And so what he's also working with is um, the Department of Economic and Workforce Development has special funding that they can support it because some businesses are willing to take an intern and can't afford to pay the intern. And so what Dr. Grubbs is hoping is that uh, DUDE will actually use some of their funding to pay students for internships if the small business can't afford to. So it's an option, not a requirement. And sometimes we have to balance getting business partners to agree to have an intern. And so if they can't afford it, we want to work with this other uh, source of revenue to help support that. That's a wonderful answer because you yeah. really don't want to shortchange the children because a business is small and can't afford that pay. That's that's excellent. I'm glad that we have that option. Thank you, or at least looking at that. Thank you. Yes. Um, that is the cutest little girl. OK, That's, that is Dr. Biancoli's daughter, Ellie. She is beautiful. Oh, Thank is you. <laughs> Precious. <laughs> All righty. Um, we need let me ask a question about the vote because we do have to approve this. Is that correct? So are we looking at these? Separately, or is this when you did the contract or will do the contract? Is it coming as we saw it today as one? How are we? Yes, so that the, uh, Dr. McCombs, do you want to answer or would you like me to? You can go ahead. OK, so um, there's no contract. What will happen is the phase forms, which is the actual process that documents the course number, the schools where it'll be offered, um, goes forward with this committee's recommendation of approval for board signature. So once this committee okay. approves it, then I have the permission to put it in the course catalog so that gotcha. schools can sign kids up. All right, so it's it's done. It's just it's a matter done. of putting <laughs> it in the catalog. Yes, ma'am. Got it. All righty. Um, I, like to have a motion to approve these courses for the course catalog. Did I sure. state that well, um, Ms. Shea? All right, thank you. Then I'd like to have a motion to do that, please. Again, it does not go to contracts. This is merely to put it in, put them in the course catalog. So I move, so move to Offerman. Second All right. Off. Thank you, uh, Mr. Offerman, for the motion and uh, for for uh, making the motion, and Doc and Mr. Thomas for your second. Uh, Ms. Cox, if you will, can we do a roll call vote? Yes, Ms. Pastor. Yes. Ms. Mack. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and Thank you, you may go forth with our blessings. All right, so now we're ready for social studies. Social and, studies. All righty, so we're looking forward to that, and 
Uh, is Mr. Billingsley going to make the presentation or you, Ms. Shea? I am here today with Dr. Biancoli and Mr. Mike Crispins. They are my secondary and elementary coordinator. I know that we had a team conflict with some work with MSTE, so I think Mr. Billingsley might still be there. And so um, he may join us if he's able, but we are in capable hands with our two coordinators here today. I think you're right. So we I will. I feel very confident. Um, so. We are here today because our social studies office works to provide incredible opportunities for our students that go above and beyond the curriculum. So all of our students have opportunity to an engaging, high quality curriculum aligned to um, our standards. And we offer a number of additional opportunities, some of which are offered countywide, some of which um, are supported in specific schools. And so um, Dr. McComas was gracious enough to give us an opportunity to celebrate those different offerings so that we can build an awareness with a larger community of stakeholders of all the ways that we're supporting our students' development of financial literacy, uh, civic action, um, and opportunities to participate in our democracy. So next slide, we're gonna start with um, our um, celebrating our staff. So we've had some big winners in social studies um, that really help to um, put social studies teachers, of which our very own Dr. McComas is one as well, um, really front and center in the spotlight. So I'm gonna let Dr. Biancoli and Mr. Crispins talk about the individuals, some of which I'm sure you recognize, um, but it's been a great year or two for social studies um, in BCPS, and we're really proud of these teachers. I want yeah. to talk about Mr. Lay. He was my hire. That's yeah. right. <laughs> well, thank you, Ms. Kester. I'm the first one to promote him. That's right. Okay. We appreciate you. <laughs> Well, Ms. Pesture, members of the board, uh, Baltimore County leadership, Dr. McComas, uh, Ms. Shea, of course, Dr. Holmes. Uh, thank you everyone for giving us an opportunity to speak this afternoon. Uh, the Office of Social Studies is small but very mighty and we have had one great 2021. So as you see on the screen, we have had some pretty prestigious winners uh, that have, are going to begin to shape things, not just in Baltimore County, but in the state of Maryland and of course across the country. So uh, I'm happy to share that during this past year, Cliff Kolcher from, he was at Joppa View Elementary and he's now at in the virtual learning program. Uh, he won the Maryland State Social Studies Elementary Teacher of the Year uh, this past year um, through his dedicated and hard work. Ms. Brianna Ross, as you guys all know, uh, has won the Baltimore County Teacher of the Year, the Maryland State Teacher of the Year, and hopefully, I, I, I'm not sure if she's a finalist for the National Teacher of the Year, but we sure hope she will be. She, um, <laughs> she absolutely should be uh, for her tremendous work over at Deer Park uh, Middle. And then of course, uh, Mr. Adam Lay, who was uh, the Maryland State winner for the Gilder Lehman uh, History Award. Uh, Dr. Biancoli, is there anything you wanted to add uh, to that? No, we're just really happy to everybody who hired them in the first place. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so it's just wanted to take a minute to celebrate. We have some amazing uh, teachers here in our uh, uh, Baltimore County with social studies. Uh, next slide, please. So I have the privilege of sharing just a little bit about our elementary programs that we continue to support. And I wanna first start by talking about the Black Saga program. So over the past 18 or so years, a few more than that, Baltimore County Public Schools has participated in the Black Saga program and it was created and copyrighted by university professor, Dr. Charles Christian. Uh, now, as you may know, the Black Saga competition was developed for elementary and middle school students. It required students to work in small teams, usually no larger than three, to memorize more than 700 facts, images, quotes, landmarks, pieces of artwork, uh, many, many things. And then students then participated in a district competition each February. And there was always a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and excitement for the district competition. However, there were also some flaws. For example, schools were limited in how many students could participate and the program centered on struggle rather than achievement. As a result of this past year with COVID, our office, along with our coaches and sponsors of the program, uh, had the opportunity to reimagine the program to fit the virtual environment. So last year, we made some significant modifications to allow students to explore and celebrate uh, the greatness of Maryland icons like Francis Ella Mockins Harper, Thurgood Marshall, Matthew Henson, and Elijah Cummings. Students conducted research about each of the individuals and then completed a summary activity at the end of each. Uh, so after learning about Elijah Cummings, students were asked to consider the ethos, pathos, and logos of speeches to recreate one of his speeches in their very own way. And because of how awesome this is, I just wanted to take a moment to share one of those amazing recreations. And this is Allison Gray, uh, a seventh grader from Lock Raven Technical Academy. Is there a chance we could have the video play? Yes, but of course I have to apologize to Mr. Corns because I forgot to give him the heads up. So just give him a minute and he's going to share it with the audio so we can hear it. 
OK. So as he's preparing that, uh, <laughs> Allison had to recreate, and this is Elijah Cummings' very first speech on the floor of the House of Representatives, or excuse me, the floor of the Maryland General Assembly. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the House of Representatives uh, when he first became uh, a delegate. Thank you, Mr. Corns. I've often said on the floor of the Maryland House of Delegates that our world would be a much better world and a much better place if we would only concentrate on the things we have in common instead of concentrating on our differences. It is easy to find differences, very easy. We need to take more time to find common ground. And so, my mission is the one that comes out of a vision that was created long, long ago. It is a mission and a vision to empower people, to make people realize that the power is within them, that they too can do the things they want to do. And so I am about that mission. I'm looking forward to joining with all of you as we travel this road I often call journey, which I define is life. And there is a poem that was said many, many years ago that I say sometimes 20 times a day. And it's a very simple poem, but it is one that I live by. It says, I only have a minute, 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, I did not choose it, but I know that I must use it. Give account if I abuse it, suffer if I lose it. Only a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. And so I join you as we move forward to uplift not only the nation, but the world. Just amazing, amazing stuff. I, I get goosebumps. I've heard that 50 times and every single time I get goosebumps. It's amazing. Um, uh, next slide, please. I've often said. So the modification of the program received such great feedback from our club sponsors uh, that as a result, the, a leadership team comprised of elementary and middle school coaches and sponsors this summer, uh, we developed that team to make modifications for this year's program. And since the Black Saga competition was copyrighted and there were chance, uh, changes that we planned to make, we had to make a new name for the program. So Black Excellence or the B program is the next step in the evolution of this program. Uh, the B program centers on the celebration of African American history. It's comprised of three essential components, uh, a book study, a school-based competition, and then an independent student research opportunity. Uh, the book titles you see here, they're up in the top corner, um, are being featured in this year's program. Four titles for elementary school, uh, one title for middle school. A little shout out to A Ride to Remember. That is uh, the story of the integration of Gwen Oak Amusement Park um, in Baltimore County, actually, of all places, uh, on the same day that Martin Luther King gave his um, I Have a Dream speech and the March on Washington uh, is the same day that that happened. Um, so we're going to actually hold our district event on February, um, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Saturday, February 26th, where students are going to get a chance to share their research, uh, their book presentations, and I encourage all of you to attend. Uh, it's going to be at Carver. Um, and our time is still to be determined. So we're still working out the logistics of exactly what that would look like. But in the midst of the pandemic, uh, the program has not returned to the pre-pandemic participation numbers that we once had, but participation is stable and it's growing. Uh, this year, and this slide's uh, actually a little incorrect, only because, uh, because of the modification of the program, we've been able to add schools throughout the year and there's no penalty to adding them late. So uh, this year we now have 20 elementary schools, nine middle schools, and our first high school participating in the program. And we had one middle school and one elementary school that jumped on just this past week. Um, and that's a drop of just five schools from our pre-pandemic participation numbers. Uh, coaches and sponsors really love the new program and so do their students, to be honest. Uh, teachers like Colleen Newman over at Pedonia shared that there are significant bonds being created among her students. And Marshetta McLean from Millbrook Elementary shared that it has engaged her students uh, in a new way to buy into the study of history and experience the genius of the Black experience. Uh, and while our coaches and sponsors have shared this awesome news, uh, they've also shared that the approval process for EDAs continues to be a little bit of a barrier uh, as they establish their team uh, to get started the year. Next slide, please. Um, Mr. Christmas, before you transition, I did also want to make a note because I know you said this earlier, while the number of schools is slightly down, can you talk a little bit about how many children can participate at the school and how that has been a big change? 
Oh yeah, this is a big change. So uh, in years past, school teams were usually three to six students based on the number of teams that they had. Um, just this past week, we were able to get some intel from some of our schools. Joppa View Elementary's team this year are 42 students. Berkshire Elementary, 38. So the number of students able to participate in each of our schools has grown dramatically. Uh, and that's been a huge plus and a huge win for the program. Thank you. My pleasure. Now, next slide. <laughs> yes. <Now laughs> Thank next you, slide. Mr. Corns. Well, uh, so, several, so several months ago, we had the chance to talk about personal financial literacy and we shared our beliefs, goals, plans uh, around financial literacy. And our office is excited to share with you that uh, many of our students continue to participate in the stock market game. Uh, the stock market game is a competition and also a simulation where students invest money into st the stock market and develop a comprehensive and diverse financial portfolio. This year, I'm happy to share that we have partnered with the First Financial Federal Credit Union, and they are uh, paying for all Baltimore County Public School teams to participate uh, in the stock market game, and we are so incredibly thankful uh, for their support and their partnership. Uh, now, the stock market game can be scary for some, but to be honest, our students are hitting it out of the park. Uh, Baltimore County's teams are routinely at the top of the leaderboards. Uh, just two years ago, students from Owings, Mill, uh, Owings Mills Elementary had 128% return on their investment in just three months. Um, <laughs> so it's pretty insane. Uh, and we've also had winners from Franklin High School, Stemmers Run Middle, Hereford Middle, Cromwell Valley, uh, just to name a few. And that's not just our students being recognized. Many of our club sponsors at each of those schools are being recognized for their uh, creative and uh, great work around personal financial literacy. Um, just before the pandemic, however, uh, BCPS TV actually highlighted one of our participating schools, Fort Garrison, as they took a trip to Towson University's Finance Lab. Uh, Mr. Corns, would you mind playing that video on the screen, please? opening bell rang as students from Fort Garrison Elementary assembled on the campus of Towson University to participate in a unique seminar. We are here at the T. Rowe Price um, Simulation Lab where our students are really able to experience what it is like trading stocks. We are in our second year of participating in the stock market game, which is a really exciting club where we're able to really stretch and extend our math curriculum in the area of financial literacy. Our own reading specialist, Mrs. Stacy Siegel, has ran this group for two years where students are able to create a portfolio where they are able to trade stocks of up to $100,000. We compete with other schools online and at the end determine who has earned the most money. I like about this program is that you could invest in stocks and it's fun to learn about like how, and it gives you like exposure of how less when you're in your 60s, how many of these companies will still be around? As a parent, you know, having a child learn about the stock market at such a young age, I think, will be extremely important as they get older because when they get out into the workforce and start earning a living, they'll start to understand the value of a dollar and, you know, what long-term growth could be. And, and, and investing in the stock market is a great way to have money grow, and it's, a, and it's, it's something that you could do at any age, and starting early, um, will definitely reap the rewards as they get older. It's really critical that we begin looking at college and career readiness, even at the elementary level. And so by exposing children not only to future careers, but also financial literacy, we are able to really create a foundation of being financially sound and productive citizens. Although it's a virtual stock market game that is engaged with other finance teams across the county, these students seem to have a pretty good handle on their stock likes and dislikes. Tesla, um, it didn't do so well. Um, we did Amazon, that kind of helped us be a little stable. And iRobot, that didn't work that much. And Nike, that was a good company too. My favorite stock is Amazon. They're up because um, a lot of people shop on Amazon and they get a lot of money. At the end of the trading day, these students are certainly getting primed in the world of finance. Um, Mr. Crispins, as you transition, I do want to just make a note too. Um, again, as I started off 
all the students in Baltimore County have access to curriculum addressing financial literacy. So a few years ago, we changed um, the work that we were doing and created a pre-K to 12 curriculum mapping. So students had an opportunity for direct instruction in financial literacy that culminates then with that personal finance economic theory or PFET course, which was a revision of the old EPI. Um, so I just want to make sure while we know that it's a smaller number that has some of these supplemental opportunities and we certainly hope that continues to grow. It is in addition to that baseline that we ensure all students have access to instruction at elementary, middle, and high school levels. So back to you, Mr. Crispin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this year uh, we have elementary, middle, and high schools all participating in the program. Uh, you can see our numbers on the screen and we actually expect that number to rise as our spring session begins uh, in January and February. Um, and in the video, Hope talked about financial literacy being more than just exposure to career opportunities. Uh, and in the words of my friend, Dr. Mike Grubbs, uh, we have a program for that too. Uh, we also partner and work with the Junior Achievement of Central Maryland. Uh, schools and students can participate in three different programs with JA. They have their BizTown program, Finance Park, and their JA Inspire event. Uh, BizTown and Finance Park are career simulations for elementary and middle school students. And while no schools are actively participating in either program, uh, this year, it's not because they don't want to. Uh, JA is actually opening their brand new facility for students. Uh, the plan was in January of this upcoming year to, or in 2022, to um, unveil their new program and new new facility. Unfortunately, some shipping delays have pushed some things back a little bit, uh, given the world of COVID. So we're expecting that to happen in March or so. Uh, I uh, post a note with seven different schools that are all interested in getting into that facility as soon as it opens. So uh, there is certainly interest. Uh, and to support the, the pro that program, transportation costs uh, are typically our largest barrier in getting students there, um, but that seems to be uh, just about it. Uh, JA Inspire is a unique experience for our eighth grade students. Uh, it's led by CTE and JA Inspire connects social studies teachers and students to the career and magnet opportunities in their communities. This year, all of our eighth graders had the opportunity to participate in a virtual fair uh, to experience and explore careers on November 18th. Um, I haven't had the chance to get all of the feedback data from schools uh, to learn more about what their thoughts were, but I have heard uh, just from the teachers and the students and of course my own experiences that it was a pretty successful event. Um, at this point, I'd like to pitch it over to Dr. Biancoli who can share a little bit about our secondary programs. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide please, Mr. Corn. So I just want to give you an overview of some of our core extracurricular programs in secondary social studies. Um, Model UN, Mock Trial, and Civics and Law really form the backbone of our extracurricular programs. Our Model UN program is something that we do in conjunction with Towson University, and this is actually the 20th anniversary of that partnership and the 20th conference that we've had for our students. So we have 17 of our Baltimore County schools participating, as well as some private schools that opt in. Um, they had their, it's normally a fall, one day in the fall, two days in the spring. So they had their one day in the fall in November as a virtual session. And in the spring, they will have an in-person co conference at Towson in the brand new student union. Um, we had to relocate for a couple of years because they were remodeling it. And apparently it is going to blow us away when we get to see what their brand new student union looks like. Um, and it really is a great opportunity for our students to have an on-campus experience at a four-year college. Um, they love the fact that they get to go eat in the dining hall <laughs> uh, with the idea of like an all-you-can-eat dining hall. Um, but they also get to interact with college students because there's a number of Towson students who act as volunteers for this program. So they really get that experience in addition to essentially creating a model UN. So they simulate based around a specific problem for the year. Um, what it is like to participate in the United Nations. They give their interest speeches. They have a communication system where they're running messages back and forth and they're trying to make sure that, you know, they're collaborating with different countries. And it truly is absolutely amazing to see how engaged these students become. Uh, so that that is our one of our flagship programs. Our other is our mock trial program, which we do in conjunction with uh, the Maryland Youth and Law Program. So with my law. Um, this year they're running it as a virtual competition, which actually works very, very well for a lot of our schools, because one of the barriers some of our schools have is the transportation to the Towson Courthouse, because that's where we hold most of the events. So by running this as a virtual platform, they still get to present their cases to practicing attorneys. 
to be heard by sitting judges, but they don't have that transportation barrier. So that's actually one of these pandemic shifts that has worked very, very well for some of our schools um, and has enabled them to continue participating where transportation could have been a barrier in the past. Um, Franklin High School, who is our sort of local powerhouse team, our BCTS powerhouse with their Law Academy, um, they just actually placed 10th out of 32 in an international mock trial competition. So they are definitely um, Yes, you know, one of the, the stars here in Baltimore County, but we have a number of schools from all over the Beltway, from all zones of the, of the district that participate. Um, our civics and law program is one that we run in conjunction with the Baltimore County Bar Association. And that's one that in the past, we've taken students, we've taken about 90 to 120, uh, two times a year, to CCDC, so whether it was Owens Mills or Dundalk tended to be the two, and they were able to hear presentations on a variety of topics, things like um, social media and the First Amendment, or uh, the use of cell phone data in criminal trials, so kind of really interesting things they might hear on the news from practicing attorneys. Um, we've had this, you know, the, attorney, the state's attorney participate, as well as um, other members of the bar. Um, what we decided to do this year is actually see if we could expand the number of students who get that uh, opportunity by sending the actual members of the bar into classrooms and into individual schools to do presentations. So instead of maybe only being able to take one school from Randallstown, maybe instead we can have three government classes combined to hear a presentation. So it really helps to eliminate that space issue that becomes the problem when we're pulling them uh, to CCBC. So that is something that's going to get started here in the spring. Um, mock trial is actually just getting underway now and the trials will start in January. And as I said, Model UN had their first and we'll get the rest followed in the spring. Um, next slide, please. So we have two additional programs that our students participate in. Um, one of them is the Maryland General Assembly PAGE program where students are able to submit an application and apply to be a page on the floor of the Maryland General Assembly during their session that runs from January to April. Um, and so every year we have a certain number of Baltimore County students. We have 14 slots for both public and private schools in Baltimore County. And those students are given that opportunity to go and to interact with legislatures, legislators at the legislature. There we go. Um, this again this year will be running as a virtual program so they have again that opportunity for that interaction um, without the stay in Annapolis but they are getting that ability to go and visit Annapolis and having those in-person visits. Um, it's an amazing thing to witness them sort of all wearing their their jackets as they participate in their blazers um, and having that opportunity, which they were not able to have last year, to have that in-person visit to the State House um, is a really great opportunity for our kids. And then the last piece is our is Voices and Votes, which is actually a traveling exhibit from the Smithsonian that we were asked to participate with. And so it's currently on display at the Baltimore County Historical Society, uh, started on the 27th of November, runs through the end of January. And it really just takes the evolution of voting and democracy in the United States and does it through this traveling exhibit. And we had several of our teachers from Towson, Hereford, and Pikesville who worked together to develop lessons that could be incorporated into our American government and our US history courses that made use of the resources provided by the Smithsonian. Um, and the Pikesville uh, Media Group actually also produced a short commercial uh, to encourage other people to use and to see this program. So it was an exciting opportunity that presented itself to us and we had our teachers who ran with it and did an amazing job. Uh, next slide, please. We did have one program change for 2021 and that is our Model Congress program. And that was another one where running it as a district-wide program really constrained us into the number of students who could participate because it was limited by the number of kids who could fit into the Cockeysville open space. Um, so it really was, you know, you could only have a certain number of students from each school coming and simulating what the U.S. Congress would do in the work of the U.S. Congress. And so what we've done is we've shifted to something that is going to allow us to support model Congresses in schools so that 
many more students from within our high schools would be able to have that ability and to participate because we wouldn't have that space constraint. Um, so I know several of you have been there. I know Ms. Kastir, you spoke to the group the one year. Um, so it's definitely a shift in the dynamic of what that looks like, but our hope is, is that it's going to expand that opportunity to so many more students when we're not being constrained by you know, how many kids we can fit in a room. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> And this is the, the last one that if you were here, Mr. Billingsley would be talking about. Um, this is another interesting and slightly different collaboration that we have worked with uh, through with Baltimore County Community Outreach, but also with our art and music office to really bring to students uh, art and arts related programs from around the world and for them to really be able to see what that looks like in context. And when the program was initially brought to us, it was one where the performers would come to the schools and put on a performance. So if it was a quartet or if it was a singer, they would come and they would perform and students that say Towson or one of the other schools would get to see them. Then we had a pandemic and you had, because most of these people are not coming from within the United States, there was a lot of, well, how do we continue to support a program when we have issues with international travel? And so one thing that we were able to do was to really flip this and have working with fine arts and working with Creative Alliance, having these groups broadcast from their native areas. And so we actually had um, my personal favorite was the Mongolian throat singer who was performing from a yurt in Mongolia. I mean, it doesn't really get much better than that. They're getting up at all hours of the day and night to do these performances for our students. And so not only do they get that, the sense of the arts and the culture from these regions, but they actually get to kind of like see what they look like in their native regions in context. Um, so it's one, I think there's another one coming up in the not too distant future. They are publicized and available to view and they're, they're really amazing to see. And we have a lot of great response from students. Um, and I thanks, think that's thanks. it. Thank you, Dr. Biancola. Yes, and thank, thank you, you, Mr. Crispins. Um, so we wanted to leave you with a question because we dropped some dates in the chat and we know that we're on time, but we are always, always interested in uh, showcasing the brilliance of our students and teachers in our social studies programs. Uh, so we wanted to leave you with a think about question of all of the programs that we've shared, which one would you be most interested seeing in action? And then we can work with Dr. McComas too to help make that happen. So thank you, Dr. McComas, for giving our team the time today. Thank you, Mr. Crispin and Dr. Biancoli for an excellent presentation. Board members, we appreciate your um, engagement and thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you. And I have to tell you that I'm stuck on that world culture. Um, uh, what is it, world culture and context. I've seen um, about, I think, two or th maybe three of them. Um, uh, Mr. Billingsley always keeps me informed of things that he thinks I like. And so for the board members, if you haven't seen any of them, it takes you out of where you are. It, it, it I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, Mr. Offerman had a comment, then Ms. Mack had a comment, and Dr. Holmes was trying to figure out which student to get some stock <laughs> advice from. So we're going to oh, go yeah, back a little bit, but if you have any other questions, please feel free after um, the two comments and Dr. Holmes figures out which one of these very gifted students he's going to talk to. So Mr. Offerman. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, these programs are all very exciting to me and great to see them, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say the need for personal finance education from, you know, all the way up from the beginning, all the way up through high school is really, really important. Yeah. Uh, we send students out with, you know, and then they have to, we, we try to make them college and or career ready, which is great, but we also need to, we need to send them out to be financially ready, that yeah. they have to understand what that world is about and that they're entering it because very few of them have had much direct contact with that. So. I thank you for all these things, but particularly thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Offerman. Well said, well said. Um, Ms. Mack? Um, yes, I'm going to start by piggybacking on what Mr. Offerman said. Um, I had shared this with um, Mr. Thomas. 
for a number of years, I provided a financial literacy overview to men who had graduated from drug addiction programs into halfway houses. And while I think personally the stock market's very exciting, um, the presentation I did for them talked about things like um, instant gratification versus delayed gratification, the cost of credit, um, how FICO impacts your the rates that you get on car insurance or your ability to buy a house, the present value, the future value of money, um, inflation, you know, um, you know, we're experiencing inflation right now and may maybe our students don't understand that the cost of goods during inflationary times um, are, are much more. So I hope that when we talk about financial literacy, we talk about the um, psychological part of financial liter literacy, how people end up getting in trouble um, because they spend more than they earn, and just all of those aspects, because I believe that this, the stock market is one aspect of it, but I think it's much more broad than that. So I hope that our courses do include various topics like that. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you, Ms. Mack, and thank you, Mr. Offerman. What I'll do in listening, I think we can schedule, I'll, I'll look at our roadmap to see if January or February is a good time for us to have the team back and we can show, um, walk you through exactly all the different ways that we approach financial literacy and we can highlight our new uh, PFET class at personal finance uh, and economic theory um, and how we have re really redesigned that to make that more about those personal finance choices and helping students have um, developed those really practical everyday uh, um, skills and understandings around financial management so that they don't end up being that that young person who you know the credit card marketers hook them and next thing you know, they're in over their head. Um, and so I look forward to us bringing that back so that um, you can see a little bit more deeply and, and we can have a little more focused discussion on, on all those questions, so thanks. I'd also like to say I used to, as a Verizon employee, participate in something called the Maryland Business Roundtable for Education. Yeah. Um, it's been quite a while ago because I remember we used um, overheads to write the different numbers. And I thought that that was a very, very practical program. I very quickly wanted to say that I have had the wonderful opportunity to be a chaperone for both mock trial and DECA, which is actually one of my questions why we, we don't have DECA. But I will say that watching a mock trial, being in Annapolis and watching high school students sit at the tables and present a case and then huddle when there was a you know a thing that they had to quickly address. I, I was like blown away. I, I didn't know that it existed. And I will say that particular, my friend was a teacher in Severna Park and in that particular mock trial for the state championship, Severna Park, I think, I think it was beat St. Paul's. And it was just a phenomenal experience to watch. Um, DECA, I also have um, traveled with my same teacher friend to the DECA competitions and in fact was um, in um, Georgia with 13,000 high school students. That was quite an eye-opening experience. So my question is, why don't we participate in DECA? Can I take that one, Dr. McClellan? I put in the chat, Ms. Mack, we do, it's just not through the Office of Social Studies, it's CTE. So, okay. this, so okay, I can thank you. follow up to give you some specifics in the way that we do it, but that's why um, you didn't hear it today. And then very quickly, I don't know if this is part of you or um, I, for the last 17 years, I've been participating in mock interviews at Lansdowne High School. Do we do the same process in all of our high schools? Is it okay if I take that one again, Dr. <laughs> um, yes, it's not actually run by the Department of Academics, but we do partner um, different, um, all high schools offer them in different ways. And some, um, I'm often asked at Delaney, it's one of those things, once you get on someone's list, they know to reach out to, to similar right. people. Um, so oftentimes it's done through um, the college, the Office of College and Career Readiness and Heather Woldridge's support. Sometimes it works through AVID, sometimes it works. So it, it comes to uh, the schools in a variety of ways and also through um, the CRD or Career Research Development through our CTE courses. So there's a lot of different pathways. So each individual school um, schedules that and handles it a little bit differently. 
It looks like at Lansdowne, it's the work-based learning coordinator. Work-based learning coordinator, yep, through yes. CTE. Yeah, so okay. um, what I can do is certainly, um, as I hear of those opportunities, keep you in the loop, because I know they're always looking for, I know I really enjoy that day too. Oh no, I love doing it. I, yeah. And I get my kids to do it now because they're women. <laughs> um, but I just want to make sure that all students have that opportunity. I mean, the kids get all dressed up and they're so excited and they bring their resume. It's just fun. Right. I can tell you that all schools have it. I can't necessarily say that all students because it's oftentimes aligned with the um, course or program that they're in. Um, so I can certainly try to get some more information about numbers for you, but um, I do know that those offerings happen. I don't, I just want to make sure that I don't over promise that it's every student. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you for this information. I loved it. And thank I want to thank you. I always love the um, model congress what is it called now UN, Ms. model un no the oh, one u.s trial? congress no it's still model congress is it still calling model it model congress? Congress. yeah because i've been the guest speaker twice scary yes, as that is. <laughs> but um i enjoy it watching those students just take issues and getting into their groups and handling them and listening to them and i've um, worked with a team at Randallstown once and watching the elected officials who've come in to also support the students. What a good opportunity for them to actually talk to um, elected officials in that regard. That, it's just great programs. Um, let's see, we have Mr. Thomas, Dr. Hager, then Ms. Shea put a comment. Uh, Oh, well, she's already addressed that. And then Dr. Hager again, and then Ms. Mack again. So Thomas, Hager, Hager, Mack. Ms. Pasteur, I'm finished. You're finished? Okay, Thomas and Hager. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. You weren't speaking when I was in Model Congress. Uh, back in the freshman well, year, I also uh, participated in Model Congress, and I can say it was kind of the catalyst to, to a lot of different things. It was a great experience, and I'm sad that it was paused for this year, but I do like, I, I'm very excited to hear what you said about um, kind of making it more school-based, um, because I think, when I, I, this is just speaking about my experience, it, it was kind of like a one event at the co at the conference, and that was it. But if there was some more like long-lasting things, and I, I think that's something I, I maybe I'd like to see more of with all these programs, is seeing how these can be integrated throughout the year, and not just like a one-time conference, and then we're finished for, for an event. I know mock trials is different, because there's multiple different tournaments, and same with Model UN. But even for schools that maybe don't win in a competition, but still want to participate, you know, making sure that there are opportunities for that to occur throughout the year, and not just for one. A conference. Mr. But, Thomas, let me jump in to say I must not have been memorable because in your freshman <laughs> year, I, it was my first year on the board. I should have been the speaker. I thought I was stellar. Okay, later oh. for you. Okay, <laughs> continue on. <laughs> in, what was that? 2019? Mr. Thomas, you're going to have to make up for that one, my friend. Yes, 2018. Continue on, Mr. Thomas. You're done with me. I'm done with you. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was on the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, and I presented a bill, very ambitious, that would create free of fare buses that were also environmentally friendly buses uh, across the entire nation. And uh, <laughs> very ambitious for, for a bill, but it passed through committee. To, didn't Con much continue on, Mr. Thomas, oh, continue you. on. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I was wondering if there are any costs uh, for students to participate in model UN and mock trial. Do students have to uh, maybe pay a due apply to those? So all, <clears throat> do you want me to take that, Mishai, or did you want to? Okay, so all of those programs are supported at the school level, um, and the students are not the ones funding them. So there's small fees associated um, with mock trial. I believe it's like a $250 entry fee, um, and the schools normally cover that out of their budget. And then Model UN is also a, a small fee that helps offset some of the costs for Towson. Um, at one point, students were buying their own lunches, but we've been able to support um, funding for that. And then we also provide all the transportation. So the goal is to make it as free as possible for all of our students so that that does not become a barrier for them to participate. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. That's very exciting. No problem. 
Um, and my last 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 comment was about uh, PFED and wanting to learn more about PFED. I know I had conversations with uh, Dr. McComas and Ms. Shea a little bit off off of the committee, but I definitely like to see more about that and uh, possibly seeing more of those programs like Model UN and Mock Trial and Model Congress. You know, there are so many ways to get engaged in that aspect of of uh, social studies, but there aren't that maybe necessarily that many ways for. Uh, financial literacy, but I think there were some things missing here, like FDLA. Uh, I, I know that's considered part CTE, of the social. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. So see, see, we can do. We we could come each month okay. with um, showcasing all the wonderful programs. So CTE and social studies and financial literacy is an area where they've worked really closely. So when we come back and talk about that, perhaps Dr. McComas, it could be a joint presentation because they really have braided their programs and curriculum, and I think that might help tell the whole story. I agree. I agree. DECA, for example, is mostly our business ed programs participate with that, but yeah. Awesome. Well, and I just want to say I appreciate the team coming uh, coming and sharing all these um, supplemental or extracurricular opportunities for students. We so often are just so laser like focused on the core courses and the core requirements that it was a wonderful opportunity to really highlight those things that go beyond the school day that continue to enrich our students learning and application opportunities. So I don't know if there's any more questions or comments. I know no, we, have, more. we have now Dr. Hager and after Dr. Hager, we're going to start winding down because I will not have Mr. Corns tell me that I told you so. <laughs> Okay, so Dr. Hager, you're on. I think it's another fast one. Um, I'm a math person, and so I am a little confused about why financial literacy is under social studies. I apologize if you covered that, but it feels like it should be under math to me. <laughs> and is that is that common throughout the country, or is that our choice? Yes, it's so common. Go ahead. Common throughout the country that it's in social studies. Um, typically, if you look at um, courses in K-12 education, economics and anything dealing with economics typically kind of falls within a social studies realm. Social studies is such a large umbrella. It covers everything from uh, geography uh, through economics, through, you know, structures of government to your traditional sort of history classes. Um, and so it's a much larger umbrella than people realize uh, because they tend to think of just it as history, uh, but it's social studies is, is a much larger umbrella. So, and Ms. Shea, if you want to add, certainly. Just that I was going to also add that we do talk about those types of things in math and in CTE. So if the, the standards live in social studies, as Dr. McComb was just described, and that is a national thing, um, but we do also um, talk about um, you know, using math for social justice in relationship to students understanding how um, mathematical skills and understanding things like interest rates and um, some of the other things that Ms. Mack mentioned are critically important. So there's definitely opportunities in the math curriculum, um, but the primary standards live in social studies. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Dr. Hager, anything else? All good. All good. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, anyone have any final comments or whatever for the good of the order from staff or board members? Uh, I'll just say I, I want to thank all of our committee members for always being um, so engaged and um, supportive uh, of our students and our programs that we try to provide for students. And I just want to wish everyone a happy holidays. Uh, it's been a long uh, 24 months, uh, I think, and I just feel like we're coming up to a place where I just want to take a moment to express my sincere gratitude for all of you. So thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. McComas, and thank you for your staff. Uh, you've always done a wonderful job. I've always been so well prepared and we learn so much and your people are busily typing. Good grief. I can't, I, as soon as I start to say, I'm in Shay's type, oh, wait a minute, it's Dr. Elman, wait a minute, it's <laughs> Mr. Crispins. Okay, so we want to thank all of you for what you've done, and I want to thank uh, the committee for being an absolutely wonderful committee, and Mr. Corns, if you haven't figured it out, we're always long <laughs> in the tooth. This is the curriculum committee, and we're an awesome crew, but we are about to sign off, but I really want to wish everyone a wonderful and safe holiday season, and we will see you on January. Is it January 20th or 22nd? 
Let's see. Oh, Wait I'm checking, Miss Pasture. Let me see. I, my, uh, it would be the 20th is a Thursday. All righty. Thank you. So we will see all of you back here January the 20th, 2022. With that being said, I'm going to take the liberty of adjourning this meeting and we still have time, ladies, to get to the equity meeting. Yes, thank you, everyone. Be safe. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Dr. McComas. Yes, thank you. Good night. I yes. just got to go.